If you have your Bibles, open them up to the book of Jude. We're going to start a study of this short letter over the next several weeks. We live in a strange time of church history. Amen, just a strange time, but uh, even more so, we live in a strange time of church history. Every era uh, of church history has had its share of false teachers. Paul dealt with them. You read throughout the New Testament, Paul addresses false teachers several times during his letters. Uh, But at the present time, false teachers are the face of Christianity. Think about that. Let me give you an example. Anytime mainstream media wants to know anything that the Bi- what, what the Bible has to say or what God has to say on any particular issue, they are going to get in touch with a famous TV evangelist who has made millions off twisting the words of God and making them say what people want to hear. Paul warned of that. He wrote to Timothy specifically and warned him that this would happen. And he says... For the time is coming, as he addresses Timothy, when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate or heap for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myth. In other words, the time is here when people want to hear what they want to hear. And they will find someone who will tell them exactly what they want to hear. That will cause them to feel good about themselves and will cause them to feel good and and settled and, and approve of their behavior or their lifestyle or whatever that may be. Paul said the time's coming and it's here. When it comes to Christianity, the face of Christianity is false teachers. These well-known and accepted false teachers by our time, they've corrupted the church to the point where they have prevented her, in in a big sense, of being a light to the world. When when most people think of Christianity, the first thing that comes to mind is going to be a perverted or distorted idea or form of Christianity. But truth will always triumph over deceit, light, will always outshine darkness. And this is why Jude felt compelled by inspiration of the Spirit to pen his very short but very precise and straight to the point letter. Like most general epistles, um, the author identifies himself. Uh, He says this way, very simply, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Now, every Christian can, be, can claim to be a, a servant of Jesus Christ, but not every Christian can, be claimed, uh, can claim to be a, a brother of James. And so as we investigate this a little bit, I'm not going to ask you to, to do uh, the work, but this James is almost certainly the James who became a very prominent leader in the Jerusalem church and also wrote uh, the letter that we have in our Bibles by the name of James. This means that this James, according to Galatians 1 and verse 19, is the brother of Jesus. This means that Jude was the brother of Jesus as well. Uh, Jude hints to his relationship with Jesus through uh, his brother James. Uh, But he places an emphasis on the more impressive relationship with Jesus, a servant of the Lord. Like James and his other brothers, Jude being one of them. Jude didn't place his faith in Jesus pre-resurrection, so he was a Uh, non-believer. John 7, verse 5 says, For not even his brothers believed in him. Mark 3, in verse 21, says his family, Jude included, thought that Jesus was out of his mind. The things that Jesus was saying, uh, the claims that he was, he was making, his brothers, even his sisters, uh, thought he was out of his mind. But after the resurrection, things changed. The world changed. Acts 17, Jude changed. And so Jude's description of himself is a testament of his humility and faith He could have said, hey, I'm Jude, the brother of Jesus. Listen to what I have to say. I've got got an insider tract. 
I, I've listened to Jesus. I, I was raised with Jesus. I know him better than most people. Listen to what I have to say. But with humility, Jude begins his letter, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James. James sees himself as a servant. That word can easily be translated slave, and it simply means someone who belongs to someone else. Could it be seen as a servant? Could be seen as well as a slave. And so Jude took this, this idea of belonging to Jesus very personally. Listen to what 1 Corinthians 9 and, and uh, verse 5 says. As Paul is defending his apostleship, uh, he says, Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of our Lord and Cephas? So we're told that, that Jude and his wife traveled to tell the story of Jesus. You don't really think of, of that, but it's what Paul says. The brothers of Jesus and their wives, they traveled. They became missionaries telling the story, the good news of Jesus the Christ. City after city, um, uh, as a man who once lived in skepticism, not sure what he believed about Jesus, even at one time thinking he was crazy, but now telling the good news of Jesus as one who lived as a non-believer, but now as uh, one of faith, as a believer in Jesus. That's the man, that's the servant of the Lord who writes this short letter. There's two interesting facts uh, about Jude. We might come up with more, but there are two that stand out tremendously. The the first one is that Jude shares a very close literary relationship with 2 Peter. Um, both were written in response to false teachers. Uh, both seem to address this, the same kind of false teaching, perhaps even the same false teaching, even though they don't get into what the false teaching is. They're more concerned with the behavior of the false teachers. But you can see this relationship very easily. I'm going to throw up several verses. We won't read them all, but I want you to, to notice the highlights. Jude talks about those that crept in unnoticed and deny the only master. Peter does the same thing. He talks about those that, that secretly have come in or bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master. Jude talks about those long ago who were designated for this condemnation. Peter says the same thing, uh, the, their condemnation from long ago. Jude talks about the angels and the chains under gloomy darkness until the day of judgment. Peter does the same thing as he talks about the angels and the chains of, chains of gloomy darkness and, uh, until uh, the judgment. Jude references Sodom and Gomorrah and talks about how they serve as an example. Saint Peter does the same thing, Sodom and Gomorrah, making them an example. Jude talks about uh, those that defile the flesh. Speaking of these false teachers, they, they reject authority and they blaspheme the glorious ones, referring to angels. Peter does the same thing. They indulge uh, in the, the lust of defiling passions. They despise authority and they blaspheme the glorious ones. Jude talks about uh, the archangel Michael. They did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment. Peter does the same thing, except he, he just refers to angels again who, who do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment. Jude talks about those that, that blaspheme all that they do not understand, that they are destroyed and like unreasoning animals. Peter says the same thing. Blaspheming about matters which they do not understand or the ignorant will also be destroyed and they are like irrational animals. Jude refers to uh, those that, that follow Balaam's error, and Peter does the same thing, the way of Balaam. He describes these false teachers as waterless clouds swept along by winds, and Peter refers to them as waterless springs and mist driven by a storm. And that they are, uh, for the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved, Peter says the same thing, gloom of utter darkness has been Reserved word for word in, in that case. Uh, Jude describes them as loud mouth boasters. Peter says they're speaking loud boasts of folly. And one more. Jude says, but you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they said to you in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. And Peter says something very similar, that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets 
doesn't, he's an apostle himself, but refers to the prophets. And the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days, scoffing, following their own sinful desires. The parallels are, are striking. And the, there are some words and expressions here not found anywhere else in the New Testament. Some of them are word for word. And something else that I find interesting is they occur in the same order. They occur in the same order in Jude as they do in 1 Peter. Well, how do you explain these similarities? Well, there's, there's several ways. Some interpreters, some scholars say, well, Jude and, and Peter drew from an er, the same early Christian source, and so why that's why uh, they're similar. Some say, well, Jude was maybe a scribe for Peter. And so when he felt compelled to write a letter, he just kind of took some of the things that, that Peter said, and uh, since he was already well familiar with them, and, and just used some of the same things. Most scholars think it makes perfect sense that, that Peter follow, uh, or borrowed from Jude, that Peter took the short letter of Jude, expounded on it when he felt the need, and then just made it, uh, turned it into a, a longer letter as he sent it to the churches. But I think one of the, the commentators that I read, a man by the name of Douglas Moo, makes a, a great point showing the opposite to be true. He thinks Jude followed from Peter using these two uh, verses because Jude says, but you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles, as he's referring to Peter, uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they said, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own godly desires. And Jude writes quoting Peter and refers to those scoffers already present in the world. The only clear reference to uh, doctrinal errors comes from Jude and Peter's warning about these scoffers. Peter says these scoffers that they will question whether or not the Lord will actually return. Uh, so that may be some hint uh, to the idea of what the false teaching is that perhaps Jesus is, is really not going to return. Uh, if you read what, what Peter says, Jude may have the same idea as he refers to these scoffers and, and false teachers, uh, but he refers to them as following their own ungodly passions. But neither of them, Peter or Jude, refer to any of the, the false teaching in particular. They are only concerned with, or Jude is concerned with, these false teachers drawing believers away because they, uh, of their behavior, indulging in uh, sinful desires. So this is one of the, the interesting facts, is they, they quote each other. But the other one is that Jude references two non-biblical texts. The book of Enoch and the Testament, or sometimes it's referred to as the Assumption of Moses. Neither of these you'll find in your Bible. Uh, they are religious uh, texts. Uh, some would advocate that they are scripture or that perhaps they should belong in our, in our Bible. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we reach this uh, portion uh, in Jude uh, as in, in some later sermons. But both of these, the book of Enoch and the Testament of Moses, they're called what is called a pseudepigraphal books, which means false writings. And so uh, the claimed author is not the true author. So Enoch did not write the book of Enoch and Moses did not write the Testament uh, or the Assumption uh, of Moses. These are groups of these, there's several of these books out there, maybe 50 to 54 uh, of these writings out there. And they're a collection of Jewish and uh, Christian writings from 300 BC upwards to uh, AD 300 which are not considered scripture, or, uh, but that, that's, that's just a whole other series of lessons. We may address some of that when we reach this, uh, these verses in Jude. But it begs an important question. Why would Jude quote or reference two books that are not inspired by scripture? And again, we'll attempt to address that when we reach these verses uh, in the coming weeks. So Jude had a, a purpose in writing, very, very clear purpose in writing. As you begin reading, you'll begin to notice that Jude wanted to write, his desire was to write about the common salvation in Jesus that him and his readers shared. But he, there was a, another or more, a more pressing matter that had uh, arisen. There was an urgent need uh, to identify and expose certain 
false uh, teachers or ungodly people as he references them several times. He says that they had crept in unnoticed and they had begun to distort and pervert the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so in doing so, they had denied him as their Lord and Master. These godless people, verse 8, he says, could be uh, identified in, in several ways. By their immorality, by their rejection of authority. Sounds familiar? We see that in the world today. And their blasphemous attitude towards the glorious ones, angels. And so this letter is a harsh and a very aggressive attack against these false teachers and the things that they were uh, saying, especially their behavior. But he ends with one of the most beautiful benedictions that you will read in all of Scripture. Jude says in verse 24, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. So in his short letter, Jude creates an awareness. Jude recognized that false teachers, that they possessed a creative stealth that allowed them to quietly begin to circulate their false teaching. And these false teachers needed to be identified and exposed for what they were uh, teaching and what they were doing, the behavior that they were uh, promoting, and, and the way that they would promote that and draw away those who were faithful to Jesus into living a different lifestyle. Jude also encourages his readers to stand against false teachers. We see in, in verses 17 through 21, he says, here's how you do that. Here's how you stand against them. Here's how you stand up. Here's how you prevent yourself from being uh, duped or, or caught up into this false teaching. He says, you have to remember the predictions of the apostles. Remember that, that, that they said things like this would take place. Build yourselves up in the most holy faith. You have to know the truth. The best way to recognize when someone's not telling the truth is to know the truth. Intimately know what the truth says. He says, pray in the Holy Spirit. I appreciate what, what Brother Shan said earlier. Praying it is so important to our faith. As we sit there and we, and we pray and we try to discern the Word of God, we ask Him for wisdom, we search His Word, prayer is a key component in growing our faith. But you says, keep yourselves in the love of God. He says, wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus and extend mercy on those who doubt. And also, He encourages us to save others by snatching them out of the fire. In other words... I think he, he's saying, do what God wants you to do. Live a faithful life in Christ. Draw near to God. We, we spoke and taught about the, the book of James at camp, and one of our memory verses was, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I think that's what, Je what, what Jude is saying here. Live a life that emulates Jesus. Live a life close to Jesus. And then he reminds us to fight for the truth. And firmly stand against error. Church, you know as well as I do, we live in a world right now, a culture, where firmness and convictions among God's people is seen not only as rude, but as mean, as archaic, as uncalled for, and as bigots. But Jude says, stand firm in the faith. Expose false teaching. He's not telling us to be rude. He's not telling us to be unkind. He's not telling us to necessarily, uh, he's not telling us to, to uh, name call or, or anything like that. It's not what Jude is telling us to do. He is telling us though, know the truth and stand up for it when it's spoken against. When people deny Jesus as Lord and Savior, we stand up and we confess him as Lord and Savior. 
When people say the Bible is not the word of God, it's archaic, it needs to be closed up and tossed aside, we say it is the rule and authority for our lives because it's the word of God. He speaks to us today and it's still relevant in our lives. That's what we're expected to do. That's what Jude is advocating. People in our culture, they prefer a soft and mild and sugar-coated form of Christianity that lacks conviction. That's what they want. That's what false teachers today are giving them. That's why when the media wants to know what the Bible says on an issue, that's why who they call who they call. Those who will, will proudly soften the Word of God and twist the Word of God to say something that the Word of God does not say. But Jude reminds us that there is a time and a place for a more aggressive protection of grace and truth against those who seek to rip it apart and dismiss it. And so Jude encourages us and he tells us, he says, I find it necessary to write appealing to you to contend, to strive, to agonize, to give it everything you have, to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And we have that faith. We have it right here as the Word of God. It's old. Sure, it's been around for thousands of years. But it's not outdated. It's not archaic. It's not irrelevant in our life. God says to the Apostle Peter that we have, he's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. You want to know how to live life? You want to know how to live life that's pleasing to God? You want to know what God says on any issue? You want to know what the truth of the matter is? On anything that the world has to offer, open up and read God's Word. Know the truth. And you'll know when someone does not speak the truth. And so Jude says, contend earnestly for the faith. It's my prayer for us in the next coming weeks as we open up together and study the book of Jude. It's a short, short uh, book, only one uh, chapter. But I encourage you to read it over the next several days, over the next several weeks. Familiarize yourself with it because the more I read it, the more I see it has great relevancy for what we're dealing with today in our world. The world's wanting to soften our convictions. The world's wanting to tell us what we, what we believe as disciples of Jesus is not what we should believe. It ought to be cast aside and ought to be changed. And Jude says, earnestly contend for the faith. Stand up for what is right. Confess Jesus as Lord. And trust that what he says in his word is good and right in the way that we're supposed to live. This morning, I don't know if you're struggling with something this morning. Maybe you've come here with something heavy on your heart, on your mind. And you're ready to confess that and, and, and get it off your chest we're told that if we confess our sins, that we have a Father that's just and faithful to forgive us. Maybe you're not a child of God. And you realize that your life is not what it can be. You're not reaching your full potential. You're still dead in your sin. And by becoming a child of God, by repenting of your sins, being immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you're raised to walk a new life as a perfect, blameless child of God. That's good news. Jesus died so that you can live. Whatever your need is, please come forward while we stand and while we sing.